we're gonna move to chapter three next week because today we're going to be discussing uh, chapter two base rules or base rule I should say. Um, we'll go over some of the examples and um, and do a summary of the whole chapter, and then um, and then we'll move to to chapter three next week. So next chapter is going to be full of. Um, more probability or we're going to go more in depth into what we've been seeing so um so if anybody wants to present next week just make sure to um to go to the slack channel and on the top of the um of the book club base rules uh, channel uh, there's um like a link where it says signups then you can go to where it says cohort 3 and then sign up for uh, for next week if anybody wants to present for that one. Then on the following week, which is gonna be November second, we're not gonna meet. There's some. Um, it says that we're not meeting that week. So then, the second week of November, we resume with chapter four. So just make sure that that um, that that's gonna be the order that we're gonna be um, using to move forward. So let me just share my screen so that we can start. I'm gonna have to leave a little earlier too. So I may not get over the entire chapter because I have a meeting that I have to that I have to jump to and I couldn't move it. Um, so I'm not sure how much I'm gonna be able to move um, ahead with this chapter, but I don't think it's too complicated. I think it was very, um, um very well explained in the book and it's also um a lot of like um basic concepts that we have to um sort of not memorize i shouldn't say but get familiarized with in order to move um with bayesian analysis and to um keep up with the the other chapters right because they're just going to be using these concepts more and more as we keep progressing so I'm going to stop talking and then I'm going to just share my screen. So here, these are the notes for um, chapter two, base rules. So, um, so let's just start with the learning objectives for this week. I love that these chapters or that this book is organized like this with the learning objectives first. It's um at least for me at least um it's very easy to know where to focus my attention right so um so i like that and the notes are also organized like this so um so if we go to um to this chapter um so the learning objectives are going to be basically four the first one is going to be to explore foundation foundational probability tools and get familiarized with this um, with these four concepts, which are going to be conditional probability, which is a probability of A given B. And the notation that it uses is that one, P, and then parentheses A. Uh, then there's a bar that it, it should be re read as um, conditional on B and then you close parentheses, right? So that's the probability of A given B. That's how you, you read that notation or that that's the way you annotate that sentence. Then we have the joint probability, which is the probability of event A and B occurring uh, at the same time, right? So that's the joint probability. Then we have the marginal probability. Uh, that's the probability of just one single event happening. Then we have the law of total probability, which is a probability, which is, or it should be understood as, if a probability or if the probability of an event is unknown, then it can be calculated using the known probability of, of other related events. Then we're going to, or in the book, right through the book, we conducted our first formal Bayesian analysis. Then practice your Bayesian grammar or the Bayesian concepts, which are going to be prior, what a prior is, which we've been sort of seen, um, we, we sort of understood the concepts 
um, last week, but now we're gonna see them in a model, right? So what's the prior, what's the likelihood, um, and what's the posterior, I should add here, and then the normalizing constant too. And then we're gonna simulate some Bayesian models using these functions. Okay, so let's start. So the first, uh, so when we go through the book, the first thing that we see is that they start with this example that it's very, um, at least when they were, um, when they wrote the book, um, well, I guess it's still very, very used here, at least in the US, this thing called fake news, right? So everything is fake news if it doesn't um, follow a someone's agenda but anyway um so it's it's this concept that whatever it's not true if a, if a, if a newspaper a news article is just telling lies basically doesn't have accurate detailed information that can be corroborated through several um sources then it's considered fake, right? If it's not, um, if the if the news in the if the information contained in that article is not real, it's just based on someone's imagination or idea. Then it's fake, right? It's not, it's not something true. So that's the the name that they coined, right, for that type of, of article. And the internet is plagued with that. So <laughs> anyway. Um, so these fake news are basically misleading or biased news that you can find anywhere, everywhere. So um, if we try to build a, uh, if we try to build a Bayesian model using these fake news as an example, we can start by saying that let's say we have a collection of articles, and we know based on this collection of articles that we have and prior information that has been verified um, that, that since most articles in this collection or in this set of articles are real, then we should read and believe all articles because we evaluated and we saw that 40% are fake news in this collection of articles at least. 40% of those articles were fake and 60% were real. So most of them, the majority, right, 60% are real or contain real news. So then we conclude that since most articles in this collection are real, then everything that we read is gonna be real news. That's the prior information that we have. So then we move to the, to, 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 um, to collecting some data. So someone somewhere posted an article and this article was um, had the title of the president has a secret and it had a, an exclamation mark at the end. So then we start thinking, well, that exclamation mark at the end, at the end looks suspicious. I don't think that's gonna be from a reputable source. So I don't think this article is real. So we ask the question, if an article contains an exclamation mark, which is one of those um, uh, signaled here, right? Sig well, um, highlighted here. If one, if a paper, if, a, if an article has an exclamation mark on the title, then we are saying that we consider it to be fake news. So let's, let's see. So then we have a set of articles and then we evaluate um, which articles that use a, an exclamation mark in the title are fake and which are real. And based on this little sample that we did on this collection of articles that we have, 26.67% of fake news articles have an exclamation mark in the end, but only 2% of articles that are considered to be a real article use exclamation mark. So that's that's sort of like for the example that we have here, right? So we know from our prior that 40% of all the articles on this collection are going to be fake. 
Then we collected some data and we saw that articles that contain exclamation mark, at least 26.67% are going to be fake news. So when we ask the question of this article that someone wrote that it's the president has a secret, which is because it has like a exclamation mark in the end, right? The president has a secret. So is that article fake or, or, or not? So that's what we want to answer with the posterior. That's why we have this prior information and the data that we collected. And then we will be able to answer that with the posterior. So basically we're studying, so that's the basic knowledge building diagram. And then obviously we can then, based on this posterior, we can continue the process, right? So now we have all of this prior information and we put more data into it. I'm sorry, Olafemi, you, you had a uh, yes. something that you want so to say? I just yeah. want to ask, that means the posterior there is a the new knowledge in which we are deriving from the data. Yeah, so from the combination of data and prior, so the posterior is going to tell you sort of like the answer, is the article fake or not, based on the prior information that we have and based on the data that you collected. So that's going to help you answer this question. That's the posterior. OK, OK. So then what you have here is, um, and then you can say, for example, is the article fake or not? So then you conclude, um, let's say you say, yes, yes, the article is fake. But then someone else comes in and collects more data. So you feed, so you say here, right? You you sort of, um, I don't have like a, well, you can see my mouse, right? So then you have here and you say, okay, so then based on the answer that I have here, I say then that yes, this article is gonna be fake. So all articles or the majority of articles that have um, an, an, an exclamation mark are going to be fake. So that can become, your prior, and then you feed it more data. And then you see that with the data, maybe you're, you're, you're collecting more, um, not just using, for example, exclamation marks, but now you're saying something that contains, for example, president and an exclamation mark, and you're doing more, collecting more data to understand if indeed articles that have exclamation marks are fake or not. So you feed more data into this posterior, into this, um, into your whole model. You then can, based on the new data that you are entering in here, you can update your posterior and then have a different conclusion or say, no, yeah, actually, based on new data that I collected, I stand by saying that the article is fake. So this is not just like a, what I'm trying to say is that it's not just a two-step process. This is a process that you can continue doing so, doing uh, these updates that it's, that's what it's called. Because you can have, based on the, on the, on that data that you collected here and the prior information, this is what you have now, like your answer, the posterior, if you will. But then you can update that, meaning that if you collect more data, or if you come in with a different prior and say, no, you know what? It's not just 40% of the articles that are fake. Now I have more research or more information that I got, not just from data, but from other sources. And I am updating the prior too to say that it's not 40%, it's actually 60%. And then I feed it more data. I can then update my posterior and not just reach this conclusion, but reach a new one, if you will. So that's that's all I'm saying. This is like a, the model is not just like a, a two-step process and then you answer it. This this is a chain of events that you can keep updating. But I guess, I hope I'm not confusing you guys with this. This can absolutely, uh, be, will be explained in future examples, I'm sure. Okay. But for now, let's, let's just say that we stop here, but we absolutely, don't have to. We can continue doing this if we collect more data and if we keep updating the posterior. So then let's say we have these two variables that we are trying to understand, right? So we have these, the status of the article, if it's gonna be fake or not, and the use of an exclamation mark in the title. 
whether we use it or not. So these are the two things that we're trying to relate here. So that was in the, that was, I think it was very well explained in the chapter actually. So anyway, um, so let's move on. So in order to understand, or in order to be able to answer this question, is the article fake or not, based on the prior and the data? Let's evaluate what we have. So we have that our prior probability model, this is the first thing that we use or the first thing that we establish, right? This is the workflow that we're gonna be um, working on more or less throughout all of the models. Not always, it's not just, I mean, this sounds super easy as opposed to what you end up doing, right? But this is, this is what you start thinking about this, more or less the three big steps. So first let's think about our prior probability model. So this means that we're gonna build a probability, a prior probability model from our prior understanding. So in this case, we know that the probability of an article being fake is 0.4 and the probability of an article being real is 0.6. So that's, that's what we know. And that can be noted as the probability of B. So we're gonna say that the status of an article, fake or real, is B. And A, like capital A, we're going to understand it as um, the exclamation, the use of exclamation um, points or not in the title. So the probability of B is 0.4 because we said the status is gonna be um, we're the status of the of the article is going to be identified as B, and the complement of that, which is uh, noted with this, um, I always forget to make this a little larger. Sorry, guys, if you couldn't see there. Oh, I, maybe that's going to be better. Okay, so the the complement of this event, which is going to be the opposite of what we're seeing, which is going to be the fake news, right? The opposite is going to be that it's real is noted or it uses this notation of C. Could I? Yes, that's better. Okay, so that's gonna be 0. 0.6. It's the same thing as, as, as this, it's just in notation writing, mathematical notation. Okay, so then we see that the probability um, of an article being fake or not, that's the prior probability of an article to be to be fake. That's our prior. P, B equals 0.4. This is our prior. That is our prior um, uh, probability model. Okay, so then we have to remember that a valid probability model like the one that we have here, which is gonna be that the probability of an event is 0.4 and the probability of the complement of that event or the opposite of that event happening is gonna be 0.6. In this case, fake news, right? So in order for our model, our probability model to be valid, we need to account for three things. First, our model has to account for all events. So the events in this case are just two possibilities. Either the article is fake or the article is real. There are no other options. Half fake, half real, no. It's either black or white. It's either the article is fake or the article is real or has fake information in it, I should say. So if it accounts for an event, yes, it does. It has to assign a probability for each event. And it does, right? Because the probability of being fake, we said that it was 0.4 and the probability of not being fake or being real is 0.6. And both probabilities or the probability of all events have to sum to one, which in this case it does, right? 0.4 plus 0.6, that is one. So then our probability model, our prior probability model is going to be valid because it, it, um, it follows these three rules, if you will. So then that's, that's, um, that's with what we start. So then, we go to the second part. So we saw that the first part is gonna be this prior probability model. 
And then we go to, I thought, this is, let me just see something, because I thought I had this. Yeah, mine is looking a little better. Okay, let's use this one. Yeah, okay. Looks more organized than the other notes. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's work here. Okay, so then um, let's go over other examples that are going to help us understand probabilities here. So let's see what is the conditional probability and what is this likelihood. Although before we go through that, our notes don't cover this little part right here. But let me bring the book here to explain it. Um, oh no, yeah, it goes to the conditional. Oh yeah, the conditional and then the, okay, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so then let's talk about so now we saw that this prior probability model. Okay, we understand that. Let's move to the other part, which is the other part of the equation. Um, which I don't know why they haven't talked about that here, but okay. So let's talk about conditional probability on likelihood. And what, it, what this says, or this concept, what they state is that, um, when we see that the probability that an article contains an exclamation mark in, his, in, in, in its title, that can be understood by this P exclamation mark. So we know that if an article is fake news, this is from the prior, 26 points, uh, no, this is from the data, sorry. 26.67% of the title will contain an exclamation mark. And if, it, if it's not fake, if it's real, only 2.22% of the, of the articles, the title articles will contain an exclamation mark. This is what we know from the data that we collected. So we know that the, these two things are dependent on one another or are not, I shouldn't say dependent, but they are conditional. That's a better word to explain this. They're conditional on one another, on one another. So we're saying that the, con the, the fact or the, the, the event of an article containing an exclamation mark is conditional on whether or not that article is fake or not. Because we saw that if it's, if an article contains this exclamation mark and is not fake, then the probability is, well, 26.67%. No, of being, yeah, of being fake and having an exclamation mark, then that's 26.67%. The probability of an article being real and having an exclamation mark is just 2.22%. So just, so we are seeing based on the data that articles that have an exclamation mark are more likely to be fake than real. That's what the data is telling us. So the way to put that in notation is that the probability of an article having an exclamation mark on the title is conditional on the fact that it's fake then the probability of that event, of, of those events, right, one being conditional on the other is 0.26. And the probability of an article having an exclamation mark on the title and conditional on it being real, it's gonna be 0.02% or 0.2, 0.02, not percent, just 0.02, that's a probability. Uh, Oluwafemi, you have a question? Yes, I have a question here. Yeah. Mm. Because we have seen that the probability for an article uh, being fake that is having an exclamation mark is 26.67%. Yeah. Why 
for the probability for that same article with an explanation marks to be real is 2.22%. So like oh, the 71.1% fall under which category? So the, the, the way they collected the data, I mean, I didn't collect it, right? Based on my understanding of that from the chapter is that you they collected data. So that means they went to a collection of articles and they just said, okay, let's read these a hundred articles and let's go over the titles and see which one of those titles have an exclamation mark. Not all of them are going to have an exclamation mark. So the ones that do have an exclamation mark and were fake, those were 26 articles out of those 100. Because not all of them are going to have an exclamation mark, right? The rest of the articles are going to be, I don't know, have any type of other mark if you want they're going to have commas they're going to have um points or periods they're going to have whatever you want but not an exclamation mark this is just for the ones that have an exclamation mark and that they are fake and then from the ones that had an exclamation mark but were real those were just 2.22 percent of this collection of articles let me see if that's in the book here. Uh, um, uh, 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 that's a prior. So. Yeah, it's here, I think. Yes, Recall. yes. So that is based on, they didn't really explain it that well, maybe you're right, but I assume that it comes from, from data that they collected. The course of exclamation points have been upon. Did they put it here? Let me see. Oh, yeah, this is here. Um, so sorry, it was at the very beginning. Here, for example, um, okay, let's read this paragraph. Using this information alone, so they already know about this 60% um, of articles, right? So if we go to, they have, um, this collection of articles called fake news. It's an object in R. If you download and install the package based rules, they are going to have um, this data in the package, right? So they, when they go over this 150 articles that are in that package, so this is the collection of articles that I was talking about, they're going to see that 60 of those articles are going to be fake news or are going to be, you know, based on fake information. And 90 are going to be based on real information. This is, this is like um, based on, on, on that. This is the prior information, right? Based on um, what is in this collection of articles that are in this, uh, in this book base rules. But then they went another step and then they said, okay, so now that we know that information, which are fake, which are news, uh, which are real news, et cetera. Let's see this. So using this information alone, we could build a very simple news filter, which uses the following rule. Since most articles are real, because we already know 90 are real, we should read and believe all articles because the majority are real. So this filter would certainly solve the problem of mistakenly disregarding real articles, but at the cost of reading lots of fake news. It also takes into account the overall rates of, not the typical features of, 
real and fake news. For example, suppose that the most recent article posted to a social media platform is titled, the president has a funny secret. Some features of this title probably set off some red flags. For example, the usage of an exclamation point might seem like an odd choice for a real news article, right? Because it ends here, that's the title of the article. So our data backs up this instinct in, because in an article collection, this is, um, let me see if they're using the same one. Yeah, in this same article collection, using these 150 things, um, they now study which ones were fake, which were real, but only from the ones that had an exclamation mark. See, they're filtering here only the articles that have an exclamation mark. And then that's how they come up with these numbers. So then they say, um, for example, the usage of an exclamation point might seem like an odd choice for a real news article. Our data backs up this instinct. In our article collection, 16 of 60, these uh, 16 that are here, you see that are fake. These are from the fake news. So, so you know that this article is going to be fake. And these 60 um, articles are fake. 16 are using the exclamation mark. 44 are not. And then from the ones that are real, these 90 articles that are legit, backed up information, only two are using that exclamation point. That's how they got that um, uh, those proportions. So that's 26, 16 of 60 is going to be 26.67. And two of 90 is going to be 2.22%. That's how they got those numbers. But this was based on data that they collected, right? So that's how they came up with um, with that. Um, so let's go back here. So then now that they have these two, oh, forgive me. <laughs> so now that they have um, these two things, let's go back to, we have the data, we have the prior. Let's try to understand what this conditional probability means. We cannot just say, I mean, we can, obviously. We can just say, what's the probability of an article using an exclamation mark? But in this case, the, the we are interested in studying not just the probability of an article having an exclamation mark in the title. We want to also understand how that is related with their status of being fake or not. So then the exclamation mark is going to be related in a way, or is going to be dependent on the fact that the article was fake or not. So the occurrence in this case of the exclamation mark depends on whether the article is fake or not. That probability, this number right here, is based on not just the probability of an article having an exclamation mark, but having that mark, the um, conditional on the fact that it was fake or not, right? So these two variables are interlinked, they're related, which are the ones that we have here, where are two variables? The fact that the article was fake or not, and the fact that they were using an exclamation mark. So that's the conditional probability. It helps us understand if B, the exclamation mark, if B gives us an insight in A, oh, sorry, the fake news is the B. If B is giving us an insight into event A, if it does not provide any information, it means that events A and B are gonna be independent. They're not related. But if they are dependent, if the fact that one has to happen associated with the other, that is a condition of probability. And what we have to remember is that the probability of A conditional on B is always going to be the probability of A, but it's not the other way around. So it was 
this we can understand this with the puppy example. I don't know if you remember, but in the book they said, let me put it here on the screen so that we can all remember. Um, they talked about cuteness and puppies. So um, the probability of A conditional on B is not the same as the probability of B conditional on A, but it will be P um, A conditional on B is always going to be P, con P of A, but not but these two are, are not the same, right? So they're not interchangeable. A and B conditional, they're not the same as B and A conditional. And that can be understood as saying, let's say A is going to be adorable and B is going to be a puppy. So whenever we see a puppy walking on the street, then of course we're gonna say it's adorable, right? So the probability of something walking in front of us on the street the probability of it being adorable, conditional on it being a puppy, it's gonna be one. All puppies are gonna be adorable, it doesn't matter. But the reverse is not always true because the probability of, no, I explained that, yes, the probability of a puppy conditional, so if, yeah. So what they're trying to say here is if the, object or the thing that is walking in front of us, it's adorable, not necessarily that means that it's gonna be a puppy because it could be a cat, it could be a baby, it could be any other type of animal. Well, animals are cute. So that's what they're saying with the fact that these things are not interchangeable. So these could be less than one if we're talking about an animal that you don't like. I like all animals, so, you know. I don't know what, why this is less than one. It could be higher than one. No, I'm kidding. It could never be higher than one, but you know what I mean. So it's not necessarily the fact that something adorable crosses in front of us, not necessarily means that that's gonna be a puppy. But the fact that something that's a puppy walks in front of us, that is always going to be adorable. So the probability of adorable conditional on puppy is always going to be one because puppies are always adorable. So that's the way they explain it. That can also be uh, explained as saying, I, with this, right? So the probability of, let me think, let the probability of, an, of a, if we put them the other way, the probability of a, of a news containing an exclamation mark. Huh, I would have to think about it. Be, I don't wanna confuse anyone, so I don't know. I'll have to think about switching these two to, to see that it doesn't work the same way that it does here, right? So, but anyway, the fact is that um, so that's that's how we understand conditional, right? The probability of an event happening, um, the probability of, of this event happening is not just by itself. It's related or conditional in a way, dependent on an other event happening. That's what conditional means. I hope that's clear. I don't know. I, sometimes I over explain things, but this is, um, I think this article or this, the way the book has it, I think it's very clear, right? Because you cannot just see as the probability of an article having an exclamation mark is the probability that an article is gonna have an exclamation mark given that it's fake or and that probability is gonna be completely different if it's real. The fact that it's, it will always con it will always have, well, not always, but in this case, right? It will always have an exclamation mark. But the end probability will depend on whether it's fake or real. Yeah, yeah I guess that's a better way of explaining. It. Okay, so um, then let me see. Are we done here with this part? Then they were talking about likelihood. So let's go, I don't know why they didn't put it here. Let's just go over. Um, 
because th this likelihood part is very important because it's going to be part of the model. So um, in English, sometimes, oh my gosh, I have to go in a little bit, but let's just go over likelihood and then we'll see how to catch up with the rest of the of the of the chapter. So likelihood is very important because we have to this is a very important concept and sometimes in English in Spanish Spanish is my first language Spanish is even worse because we don't have a word for likelihood it's the same as probability so likelihood and probability are not the same thing in English and of course not in math so um let's see where is that So what we are trying to do here is ascertain the relative likelihood of observing data A under different scenarios of the uncertain article status. So basically, this is exactly what we do with any model that we are trying to, to draw likelihood on or that we're trying to study. We're trying to ascertain an event given different scenarios or different conditions. In this case, like I said, the relative likelihood of an article having an exclamation mark being that it's fake or real. That's Those are the two scenarios, right? So A is gonna be the probability um, not probability, the event of, a, of, a, of an article having an exclamation mark. And then B, it's going to be the fact that it's fake. And B, complement is if, this, if the scenario is that it's real. So that's what's changing here. So that's what we're studying with the likelihood. The likelihood of B conditional of A on A is the same thing as the probability of A conditional on B. And the same thing can be said about the complement of it, right? So the likelihood, so in this case, we're comparing, and this is why I don't like these notes because I'm gonna start to make my own notes so that we know what A is and what B is because this thing is just anyway, confusing. But so we're saying that a is going to be the exclamation mark. So here we're saying the likelihood of an article being fake, given that it has, no, 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 the, I think it's read the other way. The likelihood of, yes, no, 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 yeah, yeah. The likelihood of, a fake article conditional on it having an exclamation mark, it's gonna be the same as the probability of an article that have an exclamation mark conditional on B. So then we go back to the probability of A given B, and that is this one. So this probability, this 0.26, is the same as the likelihood of B conditional on A, right? So they are the same thing because we are trying to ascertain the likelihood of observing data under different scenarios. So this is the likelihood of having a fake article given the data that we have, which is the exclamation mark, right? So um, in general terms, and then I have to go, but in general terms is the probability versus likelihood, how do we differentiate them? So when B is known, 
The conditional probability function allows us to compare the probabilities of, a, of an unknown event, A or AC, which is the complement of A, occurring with B. And when A is known, the likelihood function, which is uh, noted as L, um, uh, and then the likelihood of A, um, it's going to be the same as the probability of that event or that data happening, given the rest of the conditions. And this allows us to evaluate the relative compatibility of data A with events B or BC. So the likelihood and the probability are related in, a, in, a, in, a, in this sense, but they're not the same thing because the likelihood is going to be about seeing these things under different scenarios and the probability is just going to give us the number of something happening. Like what we were saying, I don't want to over explain this, but what we were seeing here, the conditional probabilities, right? Okay. Um, so, so far to finish up this example, which is confusing, I know this, this is all confusing. When you read it, and I think that's what we discussed in chapter, not in chapter one, in cohort one, when you read it, it's clear, but when, when you try to explain it, it's always so confusing, but anyway, so we have here um, like a table with our results so far or what we have. So let's go over this. So the event is gonna be the fact that it's, that a news article is gonna be fake or that a news article is gonna, a news article is gonna be real. Our prior probability told us that we have 40% of articles being fake and 60% of articles being real. That's our prior probability. The likelihood that we have now which are not probabilities so they don't have to add up to one and that's very important. The likelihood function is not a probability function. It rather provides a framework to compare the relative compatibility for exclamation point data with B and B complement. So in this case, the probability of an article containing, again, the probability of an article containing an exclamation mark, given that it's fake, the likelihood of that is 0 0.2667. And then the likelihood this one right here, right? The likelihood of an event having, which is going to be L A given B C, it's going to be the likelihood of an article having an exclamation mark in the title, given that the article is real, that is going to be 0.0. 2%. So that's what we have here. And that's the likelihood that we were seeing here exactly. So the first one is going to be LBA. And the second one that we saw, that's the 0 0.26. And the second one, this 0 0.022, it's this likelihood, right? Which is the probability of A given the complement of B, right? Because it's these are the real articles. Anyway, let's stop right here, which is not much. There was another example with the pop versus soda event, and I even have a soda myself here, but we didn't get a chance to talk about it. Some chapters, like I, like I mentioned in the first session, they're just too long sometimes, or maybe I'm just dragging along. I don't know, but they're explaining it in the same way just using another example. And then the chapter ends with an example of how to set up this prior probability, this prior probability, this other um, Bayesian model, but using um, chess as an example with Kasparov, which is one of the um, chess champions and chess uh, geniuses, if you will. And, um, and with Deep Blue, which is a, a computer program that, you know, they were 
usually competing one another to see if which one was better, the machine or the human and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so then that's what the model goes through, but it's basically what we just went through the first part. So if you already read it, which I'm assuming everyone did, then you're good. But now maybe you wanna reread the whole chapter based on what we discussed here. Um, and then there are some exercises that um, we, I don't think we'll ever have time to do them in class, but in the Slack channel, you're gonna be able to find that Olivier Leroy, he is leading, um, oh, I had it here. Why did I close it? Here, Olivier, he's leading cohort one, and he's going to, um, he put here this, um, this link where he has done some of these exercises that, um, so, so the answers are gonna be there. So those are always very, very useful, very um, useful, right? I recommend this one a lot because it's more of less like helping us understand if the logic behind what we're reading or what we see in of these examples, if we have it, if we, if we have, achieve that, oh yeah, this is how a Bayesian statistician thinks or a Bayesian model or thinks, right? Um, and we can discuss them more on the Slack channel if you want. Um, and then next week, like I mentioned, is this, oh my God, beta binomial Bayesian model and it's full of code. So yeah and a lot of math notation. So I'm gonna make sure that the notes have all of this because otherwise it's gonna be very difficult to go through this without it. But if anyone wants to present other than me because I shouldn't be presenting every chapter, then please be my guest and just sign up. And then if anybody has any questions or any comments that you wanna say, then now's the time. If not, then we'll meet again next week. This was a complicated chapter. You can actually also see the other recordings from the other cohorts. I, I at least remember with cohort one, we were like, wait, what's, what do you mean fake news? Again, what was the exclamation mark? It's always very confusing when you try to put them in words. <laughs> but they are there. I'll put them in the Slack channel so that you guys can have access to them. If anyone wants anything else to say or add, No, I don't have anything to say. I want to really thank you for uh, the presentation. I think it was very insightful. I really learned a lot today. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, it's, it's confusing, right? But little by little, it's just a matter of just reading and then sort of going over and over and over again. Right, so anyway, um, good night, you guys. I think it's night for you. At least uh, you will yes. know me, if I remember correctly, yes. Nigeria, right? It's yes, still day yes, for yes. me. It's night for me. This is 10 p.m. And oh, wow. Having, and I'll still be having another call, our packages, which is 2 a.m. Wow. <laughs> okay. I have to go back to a meeting, but, um, but everyone have a lovely night or afternoon, whatever you are, and we'll meet again next week. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.